So it appears as though I am broadcasting now. I hope you can hear me. It seems like the microphone is working. Just to let everyone know, and I'll say it again, I am going to probably collect these notes, and I'm going to have a quiz on these notes. And expect that from now on. So A days, um, when you come back on Monday, you're going to have a quiz over what I talked about on Thursday and Friday. B days on Monday and Tuesday. Start expecting that. And also starting next week, I'm going to collect all your notes. You're going to turn in a picture or a PDF. Uh, it's one of those things I'm going to start having to do. I don't particularly like doing it, but that's the way life is. And if you don't like it, I don't either. But we got to do it. So I am just setting up my monitor. I got a little bit of a I had to take care of something else school related. So a couple announcements then. I did assign up to page 181 in America and expect there might be a reading quiz or might not, but tomorrow there probably will be a quiz on your notes. You can use your notes on the quiz tomorrow. Just five questions, but it will be on what I talked about today. Or I'll collect it, one of the two, but either way, make sure you have your notes. When I collect your notes, you can turn in a PDF. I'll repeat this again as we go on. For some reason, I'm having a weird little thing on my production. Yes, I know, you don't like the bit rates. Okay, so, gonna finish up the colonial economy and start the wars for empire. And, it seems like a while since I've done this. Start. Good TV, isn't it? God, do I hate these things. Come on. So if you have any questions as I go on, I'm going to try to get my monitor up and going. I'm having trouble with the laptop, but I want to make sure I got it on. And remember the thing about the colonial economy. They both developed relatively unique economies. We are live. So if you have any questions, please put it on the chat. I will be able to see it, maybe. I think it is working. So I can see right now there's not many people watching it. You are accountable. I am gonna collect this. And what the heck? Yeah, there we go. All right. So this will go online. I will collect it. And I'm going to go through a bunch of stuff fairly quickly. Uh, one of those things I feel very odd, it was actually easier at home doing this because, well, I was home. And I got to act like there's people in front of me, and it's a little bit weird. But. Talked a little bit about uh, imperialism, the new colonial economies, how the north, the northern economies were much more diversified, more people came there, not we've become decisive in the Civil War. Don't forget, when we go over these kind of things, when I go over these kind of things in class, it's not that, I seem really far away, okay. <laughs> the screen is about a four second, about a 10 second lag from what I'm doing in class, what I'm doing right at the moment, and what I broadcast on YouTube. So I looked at it and all I saw was my belly and I got scared, but everything's okay. So the, um, when I talk about things in class, they have a direct effect about what's gonna happen down the road. These are not isolated little bits of trivia. And if you think of it that way, two things will happen. Number one, you won't remember it. 
things you need to remember will slip out of, out, of, out of your mind into the ether because you're not really thinking about it. But secondly, it will become less interesting. Why this is interesting is because it explains what's going on now. And this is so crucial to understanding history. If you don't understand the past, you will be manipulated and they will, people will use it against you. They do all the time. You will get, and that's part of the reason why people get so, so upset at politicians. They know politicians are lying to them, or they think they do. And part of the reason they think politicians lie to them is because they don't know their history. And that's a big element. I should add, you notice I'm not wearing a mask. People are not around. I got my air purifier on, my, my door is closed. Yes, I still have this darn smoke and everything, but without the mask, I sound, at least to me, significantly better. So let's go ahead and get started. Went through, I uh, talked a little bit about colonial imperialism. For some of you, this might be a review, but I want to make sure I got this down. Colonial imperialism is that imperialism that we think about, ruled by a foreign government. They're there to exploit resources, no democracy, and this is what we call imperial rule. But the other type of imperialism, and I think for one or two of the classes, I didn't quite get to it, so for first period, this might be a little bit of a repeat. Hey, why not? So, economic imperialism. And this is the most pervasive kind of imperialism that goes on to this day. The countries technically have self-rule, but the mother country, they control the, the government, the economy, what's going on. And why do you when I'm standing? I'm seeing my camera. I'm going to walk around a little bit. But, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to need a drink of water. Technically, it's self-rule. The mother country is in charge, or they control it, and this is where you get the term protectorate. In 1903, the United States would force Cuba to become a protectorate, and they would resent it to this very day. Most Americans don't know that. They know it in Cuba. At least they knew it up until relatively recently. I don't know right now. Exploit resources, so they want to take resources of a weaker country. So this is strong, dominating the weak. Exploit it, suck the wealth out. And of course, they don't want democracy. Because if the country has independence, they will say no. The larger, bigger bully country cannot take what we have. And this will be a big element of the independence movements of the 1950s. Basic diplomacy in the United States, that would be a classic example of economic imperialism. The United States would do this, like I said before, in Cuba. Here is a poster, and you can see it right there on your screen of, from Latin America. This is of the US from 1910, taking up the Caribbean and Cuba. This is from Cuba, saying the United States is exploiting their resources. And so the US will promote countries that don't have democracy. I should add, the United States the whole time will be saying, we're bringing democracy. Part of the justification is, it is cheaper. It doesn't look like imperialism. So the stronger country can say, we're helping to modernize, to civilize. We're helping them become a better country. And there's a big element of racism involved. A lot of times it'll be, uh, they could say that, well, we're helping a country that is white, modernized because they don't understand. And this will be used as a justification time after time. Time after time in history, the US will do it, the British will do it, etc. Cultural imperialism is very much like that, cultural imperialism. Same kind of, the stronger cultural dominant, the, the weaker one. So this leads to the fur trade. And the reason why this is so important is because along the United States frontier, I'm sorry, the United States colonial America frontier. As countries moved westward, right along that edge, right along that edge, there's going to be trade. I keep on looking at the screen and I gotta look forward. Maybe I should look at the camera. I'm gonna act like you're walking around. I don't know how I'm gonna do this best. I might go back to the way I did it last fall where I look at the camera, but I kinda like, it's hard to stand still, at least for me and talk. It's hard to stand still. I'll ask you guys. I'll get a little bit of feedback from the audience. So, colonists and American Indians traded along the frontier. Now, at first, American colonists wanted everything. I mean, they wanted 
everything that the American Indians have, even though they have been devastated by disease. Come on. The tribes have been devastated by disease, so they weren't farming the same way. So they, the tribes were desperate too to trade as much as humanly possible. Trade, trade, trade. And so they traded for everything, food, uh, furs, um, building supplies, baskets, you name it. But as the colonies grew and they got more food and more production, pretty soon they only wanted fur. They only wanted fur. I'm going to move it just a little bit. Yeah, they only wanted fur. And so with that, pretty soon the tribe is going to become very good at trading for fur. And they traded for fur for um, pretty soon they killed animals, trapped animals, killed more and more, especially beaver. Like in western Massachusetts, they killed beaver. And they killed beaver by the thousands. And soon it became easier to kill a beaver than to grow food. It became easier to kill a beaver than to weave a watertight basket out of bark, which as we all know, is probably pretty difficult. Or they became so adept at killing that they abandoned all their other previous occupations and traded for necessities, whether it be uh, muskets, a lot of time it would be rum or whiskey, or food, and they abandoned it. And it's amazing how fast people can lose skills they have. One generation is all it takes to lose everything. One generation. And so, when they gave up their old ways, pretty soon they're only hunters. Now, to the colonial point of view, ownership of land means that you farm it and use it. And by the 1660s, for example, in Western Massachusetts, they looked at the tribes along the frontier and they thought, they're just wasting this land. They're just hunters. This pristine wilderness, we want to move in and own by farming. The American Indians are just wasting the land. Oh, I, I forgot to say two generations, it's gone. And I can't emphasize that enough. They're just wasting the land. So we're gonna move in and take this land. Now, I don't think I typed that in, but I meant to type that in. The justification would be they're wasting this land. And the thing about it is, is the American Indians used the land. They farmed, they hunted, they controlled the forest with controlled burns for a thousand years before Europeans arrived. But all of that disappeared, was gone. That disappeared and was gone when, I'm gonna move something real quick. I know, technical issues. Hey, this is a work in progress. And I don't know if I'm going to keep doing this way. I might change again. Uh, but all of this is going to be gone. When the American Indians were devastated by disease. And so when the Europeans got there, they didn't see cleared pasture land. They saw overgrown wilderness because the farming ended because of disease. And as they moved westward, that's what they saw. This overgrown wilderness. And so with that, I'm sorry, I'm playing with it. Hey, you just got to deal with it. All along this edge of the frontier, all along that edge, they begin to move in along that edge, right along here, and uh, right along this edge, they begin to move in and take the land the American Indians were wasting. And of course, we mentioned before with Virginia, they would fight back hard. And so, I don't know if you can see this, but I need something to point out. So just imagine I'm pointing at that. That's why I need a green screen. God, I could get a green screen. Let me think about that. I'll work on that. But here is the Hudson Bay. And so we're talking up here on this map. And this shows how the fur traders moved out into what is now Canada all the way into what is Montana. In fact, French traders moved into there and that's where we get the name Montana. But 
This happened all along the frontier. They moved in, and the American Indians would fight back. But the area where had the biggest impact is right here in western Massachusetts. And so, what happened to the tribes, what really hurt them, and I mentioned this before about the wasting of land, to the point of view of the colonists, the American Indians became dependent upon the colonists for their survival. And so as they moved in and they're dependent, okay, they fought back. But what really hit them is when they killed all the animals, they couldn't get the weapons they need. They couldn't get the food, and there was an element of desperation. And so they moved west, more war. And here is a picture of the French fighting for land along Quebec, and this is a man by the name of Metacom. And we're coming to 1676, and one of the most important events of American, uh, in the American frontier between Europeans and the original Americans, King Philip's War. And it happened in western Massachusetts. So I'm a little bit discombobulated because I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. I don't know. It's easier with people in front of me. And so I'm whining. I'm done whining. So King Philip's War. This, the biggest tribe in the in this area were the Wapanoaks. And now it's shaking. The Wapanoaks. And the Wapanoaks were. Just imagine I'm pointing at it right there. Yes, I should get a green screen. The Wapanoaks. They formed a confederacy with their enemies. And remember, we kind of talked about how they, at first, the tribes, some of the more powerful tribes, allied themselves with the English, and that turned out to be a disaster. Well, they formed a confederacy to stop the expansion of Massachusetts colony, the English colony. And that includes Rhode Island, started by Roger Williams. The leader of that, this is the phonetically how it's come down in history. I look at it and being an English speaker, I see metacomet. I think it's I see common as a word. And you might come up with a different way to say it, but the English spell pronounced this as Philip. Meta comet became, or meta comet, I, I'm trying to remember where the meta comet, meta comet became Philip. How they came up with Philip, I have no idea. The English were notorious for butchering words they would hear in different languages, and it is a phenomenon that exists now with all English speakers, including citizens of the United States who speak English. So, they fought a massive attack. And here is an attack along, all along the frontier. A little like, it's no coincidence, it's the same year as they expanded westward in the events that led up to Bacon's Rebellion. But they did surprise attacks and 10% of the co colonial population was killed and most had to move east as quickly as possible to escape Philip's attack, or the attack. This was incredibly successful. Now don't forget, I've mentioned this before in class. American Indian tribes were much more small d democratic. People had much more of an option, and women had significantly more power. Especially in Eastern agricultural tribes, women made the big decisions, and men did the fighting and hunting, while women did the important work, the farming and preparing of food, and etc. But the British were always looking for the man to be in charge. That's where they start calling him chief, or in this context, king. But he was not fully in charge. But he's probably one of the better fighters. And so that made him a leader in this battle. 90 villages were attacked. I mean, this was, or 90 villages total were in, the, uh, in Massachusetts. 52 were attacked. I mean, a stunning surprise attack. And it worked incredibly well. And so <coughs> here's a couple more pictures of well, here is the, the death of Metacom, but we'll get to that in one second. So Massachusetts was going to surrender, and they basically were going to have a peace treaty, and they invited all the leading men, and these are the best fighters, to a place near Boston, or near Springfield, Massachusetts. And this was going to be, they're going to have wine, they're going to have basically a peace conference where Massachusetts agreed they're going to pull back to just around Boston, and the Wapanoa Confederacy won. And then, out of the woods, 
came the militia, an ambush. And this is a picture of them. They poured out, opening fire without warning, killed virtually all the leading warriors of the Wapanoaks, including Metacomet, which is right there, that picture there. So your conduct's on the right hand. Killed them and ended the Confederacy right there. Victory. And this became a template for all future wars. And the basic idea, divide and conquer, surprise attacks. And we'll see this all the way to the end of the American Indian tribes. Surprise attacks all along the frontier. How do you think George Custer made his name after the Civil War as an Indian fighter? By surprise attacks. That's what the Little Big Horn he thought was going to be. And in Montana, the Crow tribe, they hated the Lakota Sioux and the Cheyenne, and so the U.S. used the Crow to defeat them and then promptly forced them into reservations. And so divide and conquer. King Philip's war was huge. Imagine this all along the frontier for years and how the fur trade used imperialism to conquer. Take, force them to become dependent, conquer it. Over and over and over again. And this will bleed right into a series of wars for empire, mostly against the British and the French. And they all started with the fur trade. Just imagine as, just think of the map I'm showing. The British are moving west, the French are moving east, and they come along frontier. Come along the frontier against each other, and there'll be a series of fights. And much of the fights along the frontier of the French will be between American Indian allies of the French against English colonists. The French had slightly better relations with the American Indians because not, as, not near as many French came. And so, not near as many French came to New France along Quebec, and if there's not as many colonists, there's not as much pressure on the American Indian tribes that survived. And so, that's where we get um, to the colonial point of view, they're not just fighting the French, they're fighting the American Indians. That's the way they look at it. And a lot of tribes allied themselves with the French because they thought that was the best way to stop these hordes of Englishmen coming. I should add, a lot of tribes allied with the British, like the Iroquois, because they looked at it as, uh, <laughs> the French are allied with our enemy, the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. And so, we're done. We're not done. What the heck happened here? Uh, no idea what I did. You hit something and it just happens. Huh, I shut it off somehow. So, the French and Indian War. And these are going to be worldwide wars for empire. Don't think in terms of world war like World War II. World War II was a new style of fighting for humans where this nationalistic fight for a finish, something that we will learn a lot about called total war. These are going to be relatively small armies, mostly fighting in the summer, or naval battles for empire, for imperialism to control trade, remember mercantilism. So there's a series of wars I'm gonna mention very quick. Now, the first one will begin, you'll notice, as we move along the frontier, this is going to be tw uh, 13 years after King Philip's War, and the British and the French are getting closer. So these fur trade wars are now going to become a war between French allies against British colonists. So in the colonies, they called the first one after the new monarch of England, King Willop. Did I say King Willop? King William. And... Uh, not going to go a lot of background on this. William and Mary became the monarchs of France in what's called the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And when um, they, William was actually the king of the Netherlands, became the king of the Netherlands and England. And the Netherlands was at war with France. As soon as William became king of, Fran of England, England went to war with France. And so there's fighting all over Europe. There's fighting in India. There's, some, there's sea battles in the Mediterranean. So this is a worldwide war. So actually, this is either called uh, the War of 
You see it called the, the Netherlands-French War, or simply the War of the League of Augsburg. You don't need to know that. I just like putting down the War of the League of Augsburg because, as we all know, we have many Augsburg-related wars. This is my favorite. But the War of the League of Augsburg, and there's William and Mary in the picture right there, and there were attacks of these are French, and they're Indian allies attacking a, a, a colonial stockade. And I just put up a map to give you an idea how there was some fighting along the frontier. The English tried to advance into New France, which is now Canada, Quebec. But in reality, the war, there was no clear victor. And actually, it was a bloody, awful war for the French. And they maintained what's called the status quo. The status quo means when the treaty ending this war was ratified, basically what they said is, uh, we'll go back to the way it was before the war. Status quo. So it was pretty bloody, awful fighting, but nothing changed. This is part of the reason for salutary neglect. These are colonial militia fighting. And the British needed the colonial militia to fight back against the French, and therefore they couldn't really enforce mercantilism because they would get mad. The next war, Queen Anne's War. And this in the colony, or in this war, um, I just put down Queen Anne's War. This war of Spanish secession in Europe. You don't need to know that part. I just put it out there, so just remind me to say it. And it's named after the next monarch of England, Mary's sister, Anne. William and Mary, Mary did not have an heir. And poor Queen Anne would be, she wouldn't have an heir either. She would be pregnant 17 times. And none of those children lived beyond the age of one. Either they're stillborn or died very young. She, it, how she survived is beyond my comprehension. A third of all women died of childbirth back then. And yeah, she drove her insane. I mean, it, 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 poor Queen Anne. But, yeah, British colonies, New France, Spain was involved on the side, um, on the side of the French. Pretty awful, bloody fighting. The war actually was a British victory in Europe, but a colonial status quo again. Colonial status quo. Anne had no heirs, and so England is going to have to find a new family to become king. According to the <coughs> English law to this day, the monarch of England has got to be a Protestant. So they actually had to go to a distant relative in the German principality, there's no Germany yet, of Hanover, and pull over their king of a little tiny country called Hanover, a little kingdom, and he, a, a German, became the king of England. And this has become the norm. The current royal family are German descent, too. And so, ah, how did I do that? The next war, the War of Jenkins' Ear. And this might be my favorite ear-related war. And so this would be a three-year war. The French would be involved. It's a naval war. And mostly Britain and Spain, but Spain was kind of allied with France. It's complex. But in 1731, a captain on a British ship named Robert Jenkins, on a ship, the Rebecca, was stopped in the Caribbean near Spain. Near Spain. Did I say Spain? I'm sorry, near Cuba. He was stopped on the high seas. Now, what was happening? Were Royal Navy vessels and English vessels were active pirates. Even though Spain was weak by then, they were still preying on Spanish ships because it was easy. <coughs> and so they would be a normal merchant ship or even a ship in the Royal Navy. They'd see a lone Spanish galleon and they know, oh, that's easy picking. And so they would pull down the Union Jack, which is very close to the British flag today, pull the flag down and put up a Spanish flag. And that's where we get flags, because of the, they have to see each other on the high seas. And so they pull that up and get closer and to fool the Spanish ship, oh, it's a friend. And then as soon as they get too close, and because these are sailing ships, it's, they can't escape, they make sure they would get to the windward side so the Spanish ship couldn't escape. They pull down the Spanish flag and put up a black flag. Pirates. Yes, the skull and crossbow was used by pirates too. But they'd stop it, take the stuff. This was happening all the time. And so Spanish ships stopped the Rebecca. They stopped this British ship because they assumed they were pirates. And they were. Jenkins was, was pirated. 
technically he was an innocent merchant seaman, but he was also a pirate. Now, they, it's kind of shocking, but they did not kill him, partially because they did not want a war with Britain. But they stopped the ship, they roughed up the crew, and then, shocking everybody, they took Jenkins, or they took Jenkins here and chopped it off. Actually, lopping off a piece of the ear or the nose was a common punishment. Boom, chopped off the ear. Left the ear to rot and say, this is what happens to pirates. Six years later, the ear appeared in Parliament. Jenkins brought his ear in. In fact, the picture um, right here, that picture, it's hard to see it, but they're going around. Jenkins is showing his ear off. They took it to Parliament and said, look what they did to a captain in the Royal Navy's ear. Now, technically, he wasn't in the Royal Navy, but what the heck? This is what they did. We can't let the Spanish do them. They passed the ear around and said, look at this ear. Look at this ear. And it was, can you imagine what this ear was like after six years? It was like this kind of gray piece of cauliflower. But they took this ear and did that. By the way, to go to Parliament and stand in line to go uh, to the English Parliament, you go on top and look at the gallery. I did it. It's, it's pretty cool. And I was walking along, and I looked over, and there was a jar just to my left. And this, not even marked, it was a jar with alcohol or whatever in it. And there was beer, this gray thing. Not even marked. They wouldn't let me take a picture. I didn't want to go get in trouble in, in another country. But they used this as an excuse to declare war on Spain. Thus the war of Jenkins here. And yes, he was a pirate. An inconclusive naval war that was fought in the Caribbean. I always thought maybe the dog is chewing on the ear, but it's not. And so a foolish war, but another trade war. I thought a way to whip Spain. And that would lead directly to King George's War. King George's War, George II was the second of the German monarchs. He still spoke German. And they once again went to war, went to war against uh, France. You don't need to know this. It's called the War of the Austrian Succession in Europe. So it starts in Europe, spreads to the colonies. And actually, colonial militia, with the help of the Royal Navy, won. They took a couple, a key fort uh, called Louisburg on the way into St. Lawrence River. Here are um, New England militia marching, the Royal Navy a little bit further down the road. <coughs> but the war in Europe ended with another one of those status quo treaties. In fact, it's called a status quo antebellum. Antebellum means before the war. So the way it was before the war. That's why if you hear in American history, and I'll refer to it as the antebellum period, period, all that means is before the Civil War. And this why this antebellum will have this uh, kind of lost cause pro uh, Confederacy uh, reference when it comes to 19 nearly 1900s, to just, it's going to be called the lost cause, or the gone with the wind myth. And we'll get to that. But all needs is before the war. And so the colonists won, but it went back to the way it was before. No clear victory, but the French are really worried. The French know they're in trouble. Why? There are 10 times more, 10 times more British colonists than French colonists. They know they can be overwhelmed. And yes, they might have American Indian allies, but as we've mentioned many times, there's not many American Indians left alive now because of the horrors of those disease. Don't forget, as the English moved westward and then the United States moved westward, they're moving into an area that had had an unprecedented catastrophe. The Royal Navy was stronger than the French Navy. Even the French Navy was strong. The Royal Navy was stronger. And so it's difficult for the French to send reinforcements. And so the French are thinking more and more as they look at this situation. Here is the British colonies and New France. It's a big area, but it's going to be very difficult to hold. Very difficult to hold. They decide more and more we're going to need what we would call a preventative war. A war where we can attack the British and blunt their expansion. Because we know if we don't, Someday the English will conquer us. Now, preventative wars, I think once I said that, you should realize, ooh, wait a second, this could be dangerous. A preventative war 
by definition, is a war of aggression. Because can't you say, I'm going to attack my enemy because I know they're bad and someday they'll attack me. You can use that to justify any action in the world. Any action. So, we're coming up to one, uh, to a big event that will lead directly to the American Revolutionary War. The fur trade in the Ohio River Valley. This events here will lead to it. I'm going to stop right here for just a second, then I'll finish uh, the part I'm on. But I'm going to repeat now. I'm going to repeat this. So what I'm talking about today, tomorrow, my expectation is, don't worry about the bells. I started after the beginning of first period. But I am going to collect these notes, and there's a very good chance I'll have a quiz on it. And starting next Monday, I am going to quiz everybody in class or collect the notes from the, those people doing it digitally on Monday. So on Monday, I will, I'm going to quiz the A group people about what we did on Thursday and Friday. On Thursday, I'm going to quiz the B day students. Digital learning are going to have to turn in those notes from Thursday and Friday or Monday and Tuesday. And I'm probably, I'm almost certain going to collect this notes in one other day, Wednesday and one other day. You can probably guess how I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to reward the people who have worked hard and did this. This is hard. It's hard for me to do, and it's hard for you because you don't get me. me. One of the great advantages about being in class is you can see from my actions and how I'm talking and our interaction what's important. It's harder to get that here. And you can't really see now you can actually see my mouth, but you can't really see my face because of that mask. So it's harder. So I'm going to reward you for your work. I'm going to reward you. And yes, this will also encourage you to do it, but I'm rewarding you. So back to this. So the fur trade. Oh, and I'm going to make sure I'm going to ask questions that you, if you didn't listen, you know, you're not going to get. No, I will make sure. Okay, so. The fur trading Ohio River Valley, same deal. The Ohio River Valley right here was they knew we're going to have the big thing they wanted were beaver pelt. Beaver pelt. They knew there was a great trade in beaver pelt, but they also knew, I think I got this here, that it's going to be a great area for, area for farming. They killed almost all the beaver along here. They killed almost all of them. And beaver pelt's really valuable fur. There's a very thick, uh, uh, almost like needles on the edge of the fur that, uh, of the beaver fur that it would scrape off. And that would leave this fine felt that was warm, perfect, perfect for hats. Beaver felt hats would be the style until the 1850s. But also, there's land for farming. Think about all the people who want land, all those small farmers who are indentured servants, they can't get good land, that's land for them. And both France and Britain had a claim to this. Britain claimed this land and France claimed this land. So there's a race on for this land. They want the land for farmers. But also, different colonies had a claim to this land. Virtually every colony had a claim. Virginia had a claim. Maryland had a claim. Pennsylvania had a claim. New Jersey had a claim. Delaware had a claim. New York had a claim. Massachusetts had a claim. Do you get the problem here? So there is a race for this land. And it's not just between Britain and France. It's between all the colonies and Britain and France. Virginia wants to get here and claim it for Virginia before Britain puts another colony there. They don't want something else here. Virginia wants it. And think about Virginia. These are a bunch of tobacco farmers who are going, oh, we're used up the land. Where's more land of relatively the same latitude? The Ohio River Valley. And Kentucky is good land for tobacco. And so, while this is going on, while this is going on, all on the frontier, there is a real problem of relations between the different colonies, and the American Indians, 
but also the different colonies and themselves, the different colonies in Britain. I think you get the point here. Ben Franklin, during the fight for the Isle River Valley, partially because of this, he's from Pennsylvania, he would propose the Albany Plan of Union, it's going to be known as. And this is where you see that famous of the snake all divided, the join or die. Ben Franklin proposed this based upon the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois Confederacy of five tribes had this loose confederacy. Uh, they're technically independent, but they'll come together to negotiate with people like Britain. So they thought the Ben Franklin's thinking the 13 colonies should come together when they want to negotiate, for example, the Trade and Navigation Acts or with the various tribes. This loose confederation and a better trained, I put down army, but militia to fight along the frontier. So not only is it based upon the Iroquois, it's to negotiate with them. He did this. Now, I, maybe I didn't put this in. It failed. Yeah. The colonies were just too disunified. They couldn't come together. This simple act of a loose, loose confederation. Northern and southern colonies didn't like each other. Here is Ben Franklin's picture of him talking to the Iroquois. It's very stylized. It wasn't quite like that, but whatever. The colonies were bickering. They needed something to unify. This is what we call foreshadowing. The British colonies would become unified when they had a common enemy, AKA Parliament. When the British government tried to start enforcing the Trade and Navigation Acts, that's when you get the colonies unified. So, Virginia plantation owners are eyeing the Ohio River Valley very carefully. Here is a map. This is an old map. This is a map from the 1760s, and it's a very good map. Here's the Virginia plantations, and they're looking at the price of tobacco. Two things are happening. As more tobacco cultivation here, but also it's going to Turkey and, and Egypt and a few other places, the price of tobacco is dropping, yet at the same time, the soil is getting bad because the soil is being leached out. And tobacco plantation owners are panicking. If the price is dropping, they feel they have to grow more tobacco to make money. How can they grow more tobacco? If the soil is getting bad, they need more land. So add this to the mix. And they're the ones who make up the House of Burgesses. So, oh, and they're also, they're all in debt. Farmers are always in debt. I've mentioned this before. So, with that, plantation owners also have the issue of, what about the second or third sons? They're not making as much money, and the inheritance goes to the first son. The second or third son, you notice that we're talking sons here. Because daughters would have an issue too, I'll get to that in one second. What are we gonna give them? And the sons are also thinking, I better go get something. This, oh, the daughters of these wealthy families, which are copying the English gentry, the daughters would have to give a dowry. And so they need money or land to give as a dowry to the groom's family. And so they need that too. This is a real problem. We don't have as much wealth as we want. We're in debt. We have land and slaves, but we owe money. We need more land. All of this is going to lead to Virginia trying to take this land for something else too. It's called speculation. And we're going to talk about speculation more and more. Don't just write down the word speculation. Speculation means, speculation means that you're going to have, um, is when somebody buys a product like land. They buy it when the price is low and hoping that more people will want that demand or want that land. Demand will go up for that land. The price will go up and they sell for a profit. Buy low, sell high. Speculation. So you're gambling that you're going to get this land cheap and people will want it. Much of our economy is based upon this and it is of course very unstable. The entire stock market is speculation. It's like a big casino. Everybody rolls to the die, hoping that they'll be able to, be able to buy low, sell high. That's you buy stocks, sell high. People do this all the time, except for not people, but not all people. You need wealth. And they thought, if we get the Ohio Valley before anybody else can get a land claim, it'll be really cheap. 
and then people want to move in. And so this was a way to deal with all the problems. And so you have the Virginia legislature say, we got to get there first. So buy low, sell high, get land first. And it's a gamble. And I repeat, much of the US economy, I forgot to hit the button on that, but buy low, sell high, get the land, gamble. Um, it's a relatively new thing as in the last 40 years. That's relatively new. Most, of, most Americans, if they have anything saved up for retirement, it's in the stock market, and it's a big gamble. I am one of, my job is one of the few left that actually have a very stable retirement. Relative, not big, but stable. So, in 1754, Virginia was going to send, in fact, they sent them twice, militia under George Washington. Now, George Washington at first was a major and then a lieutenant colonel in the militia. He was the second son of a small plantation owner. He wanted to get there to speculate. Washington fit the bill. A young, incredibly ambitious man <coughs> who's going to march from Williamsburg to the Ohio River Valley. And he wanted three things. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to live like an English gentleman with the big mansion. You go to Mount Vernon, his home near Washington, D.C., and I recommend it. It's really cool. And it, it, you got to go. He want, it, it's like an English country house. And lastly, he wanted to be an officer in the Army, the British Army. He wanted to be this gentleman soldier, and he wanted to act like a gentleman. Now, he wasn't necessarily like a gentleman. English gentlemen, they did, they did the same thing in Virginia, had classical educations. Greek, they learned Greek, they learned uh, French, they learned Latin, they learned poetry, they learned rhetoric. He learned very practical skills because his family could not afford a tutor to teach him Greek or French. French was everybody, classical education man is to learn French. Louis XIV. He knew how to survey. He knew math. Very practical things. That's why he was perfect for this job. He could get there and claim the land first. So he began to march with militia and American Indian allies. And that is where I'll pick up tomorrow. All right, so let's real quick. I repeat. I'm probably going to collect these. I'm going to ask questions outside of just simply what I put on there. So you're going to have to be prepared. And I will do this on Thursday. Or at least collect the notes. Yeah, I, I got to decide this. <laughs> I'm worried that some people are not doing this. And I want to make sure I reward you for doing this. So I'm going to give you relatively easy points as long as you did this. And <coughs> sorry, stupid allergies. Smoke's not helping either. It just it's not respiratory. It's my throat. But yeah, 166 to 181 has to be read. I'm gonna assign a little bit uh, more tomorrow. Uh, I just haven't decided what's in and a couple other things. Uh, make sure you check Google Calendar. I put the schedule in there. And for those A Day and digital learners, remember tomorrow I will do the same thing. I'm gonna record third period, but also put it on Teams. And if there's any questions, please text me, but you are accountable for this material. And you can't just go look on the Wikipedia and find this stuff out, or even in your textbook, because I'm getting what I talk to you, what I'm telling you from many different sources. And this is way beyond, beyond most of that. And so, which is my job. No questions? All right. Good job today, and I will see you tomorrow.